And we're recording. All right. With me today is a distinguished gentleman named Richard Shin, who was part of the U.S. Coast Guard and was a lighthouse keeper for a while. And it's a great honor to finally meet you over the over the screen here. How are you doing, sir? <laughs> Fine, great. Finally. <laughs> yeah. It took a little bit of doing in order to get this, but I just gonna, I kind of want to know about a little bit about you before you joined the Coast Guard. Like, where were you born? What state did you grow up in? Well, we'll start from the beginning. Born in New Jersey. Okay. A town by the name of Haddon Heights, which was a commuter town to uh, Philadelphia, basically. And uh, the people were either farmers or worked in the big city of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. went by train. And, of course, that was in the 1928 when I was first hatched. But uh, <laughs> we lived there and... Then finally, in 1945, at the end of World War II, my dad just decided up and out of New Jersey. We moved to Florida in a, with a little two-wheel trailer pulling behind us with all of our belongings in it, in a two-wheel wow. trailer, <laughs> two sisters and a dog and a cat, and uh, ended up in uh, Clearwater, Florida, and, and then... Uh, a year later, my dad acquired a, a boat, a boat, not a ramp, but a dock, fishing dock, mm -hmm. at that time considered to be the largest individually run uh, marina on the west coast of Florida. It's been superseded by its own town now. But at that time, it was just a big one. And so that's where I worked and worked around small craft. And we also had a little seafood restaurant on there. And so my grandmother, the old German, she did the cooking, and then I did whatever I needed to be done. And my dad was the talker, <laughs> and uh, we had we had all kind of luminaries there. Even August Bush, the owner of Bush Bavarian Beer, mm -hmm. sure, he would come down. He'd call. Wow, Min uh, I think it's Minnesota or someplace up there where they where they brewed the beer. St. Louis is where they had the main. Say he'd be in town, such and such, and he'd like to have a table for six at eight o'clock on Tuesday. Wow. So sure enough, we'd have it all done for him. So that was the way we got it started. And then we uh, got rid of it and and then opened a restaurant in downtown Clearwater. And we call Shin's Marine Marina, uh, Marine Grill. And I was there until 1950. And shucking oysters and clams and talking to the people as, as well as did my dad. And then, of course, the Korean War started, and I had a couple of options either go in the Army, the Navy, the Marine, or the Air Corps, whatever. And uh, I had been working on the boat docks, as I said previously, that I had a license for hailing small craft up to 65 foot. Okay. Uh, commercially. And so I said, I'd like to get in that. And so I Went to the Air Force because they had small craft uh, boats, 95 footers that they would use for crash boats. Okay. Downed aircraft. So I went over to Tampa to the recruiting center and talked to them. And then the recruiting officer said, okay. So he excused me and he went it's in the back. It's thirty. He went in the back room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, was going about two minutes and finally came back out. And they said, well, he said, we have an opening for uh, quartermaster, he said, but the, he said, uh, you'll have to leave tomorrow morning. I said, I can't do that. I can't walk out with my dad in, tw in 12 hours. Right. Two weeks, so I can't give you two weeks. <laughs> uh, well, okay. So I walked out the door. So I said, well, it's the Coast Guard. They have small, <laughs> boats. They have small boats. So, and they had pulled, they had, they had moored their boats up at our dock a few times when they'd be patrolling out there in the Gulf. Mm hmm. And so, anyway, I went over there and they said, sure, we'll take you. So I signed the paper. Two weeks later, I was on a train, which no longer is there in the Clearwater, Florida area. But we went to the East Coast and we met a few more guys that were also recruits. Uh, and we went on up to Cape May where we got our preliminary tra training. And that was an experience for myself, but that's another story. <laughs> Anyway, we got out of there and I was assigned to a temporary additional duty TAD 
at the base down in Miami, which originally had been a, a dirigible base for World War II for blimps to go overhead looking for sub submarines. Okay. So anyway, I was there for three weeks and then they called us out on muster one morning. So we're all lined up to two lines and the officer came out and greeted us and he said, well, he said, I have a couple of bases going to have to be filled now, positioned, so I'll call out positions that we have available. So he said, well, we need keepers for lighthouse duty. Please, uh, say, volunteers, please step forward. <laughs> I step forward. <laughs> <laughs> So, finally, I said, well, with my damn German personality and background, I said, with my luck, I'd probably be it. So, he, he said, he repeated one more time. I'd like to repeat one more time. Do we have any volunteers? So I said, well, what the heck? So, I stepped forward. So, yeah, I know the next day I had a sea bag over my shoulders and, <laughs> and heading on a Greyhound bus for Marathon, Florida. Wow. And uh, it was a couple hour ride. So, we got down there with Marathon, just a little fishing village. We pulled into the gas station grocery store combination. And uh, I got off the bus and there was a fellow there with a t shirt, a white t shirt, and, and uh, Bill Bottom Levi's on. <laughs> and he said, Are you Shin? Uh, I said, Yes. He said, well, I'm, I'm McVeigh. Uh, we're out here at the lighthouse. I said, Oh, okay, good. I had no idea what I was getting into. And uh, so Had you ever I, even been to a lighthouse yeah. before this? No. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, oh, we, oh boy. And, and uh, followed him. We went through the mangroves there on the opposite side of US 1. Not sure to be on the east side, in other words, because the islands are going north, the roads are going north and south there, <clears throat> east and west. So, you're, the road was heading east and west there. So, we got on the north side of it. And, uh, Still going through the mangroves there. Now we go up to a little alcove there, and there's boats. Mm -hmm. I mean, a boat, a little old dock about 10 foot by 10 foot. <laughs> a little boat nor, uh, moored there. It's a little double ender. And there were two ended bows. Mm -hmm. and, and then the steering wheel was a rudder sticking out over the rear end of it. <laughs> a little hatch in the middle and a little cabin forward of that. So we got in the boat and and uh, dislodged it and cranked her up and went on winding through more groves and finally got out in the ocean. So then I'm looking around, I don't see any lighthouse. And so we start heading one direction, which, which actually was probably just about a little bit west of north. I mean, yeah, a little bit west of north. And I look way up in the horizon, there's a little thing sticking up in the water. And I said, that's it. He said, that, oh, yeah, that's it. So it took us about a half an hour to get out there. Okay. So when you see this little thing on the, coming up on the horizon, what are your thoughts? You see this little thing. What could possibly be going through your head? I didn't worry about life. I didn't worry about anything. You know, I just. You just take well, it as it comes. I was going to get into it, you know. I mean, I, so I just went ahead and sat there and waited until we got out. And then we got to the light. That was a, was a shocker because how do you get out of the boat? <laughs> built, so to speak, you know, mm -hmm. the, the work platform, then above the next platform up was the quarters with a light above that. And uh, so, anyway, we uh, pulled up to the stanchions, uh, stanchions sticking down in the water there, the post. There was a rung ladder going up the side of one of the posts. Mm -hmm. And so he had me climb up that ladder to the deck. And then he stayed in the boat and they dropped lines down with two uh, lock and tackles up on the deck and then secured him to the bow and to the stern. And he got out of the boat, climbed up the ladder. And so I was on one job on one on one winch. They were all handled by hand. They weren't electric like they were a few years later. OK. And uh, so I had to crank them and we raised the boat up to the deck and then we pulled it in and had big straps made out of canvas that were one under the belly of the boat and we were able to secure it so it wouldn't be able to move back and forth on while it was hanging there. Mm -hmm. The winds picked up, it could do a lot of damage. So anyway, that was it. And that was my 
introduction and the, you see the quarters, which are evenly divided into four, mm -hmm. the square little building. And the one quarter had the officer in charge, uh, bed and so forth. Then the second quarter was for the enlisted men, which would be three of us. And then the third quarter was the galley, also where we had an anemometer for the checking the wind velocity and direction and so forth. Then the radio, ship to shore radio, as well as the refrigerator and, and the stove. Okay. And uh, then the fourth one was where the two engines were for running the batteries, keeping them charged. Mm -hmm. And so that was it. So I was introduced to the members. There was never more than three men on there at one time because there's only uh, four men. And uh, we took what we call compensatory liberty, which meant every every month we got seven, eight days off. We could go for sure and go wherever we wanted. And uh, so there's always a minimum of one man. There's supposed to be two men on there all the time. But, but it didn't always work out that way because of storms or mm -hmm. other reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, that was the way it started. So there was nothing out of the ordinary that way as far as I can start. It was just a new experience. I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. And uh, they changed crews every so often, one at a time. They would never fix it all together because that way they wanted somebody that knew what they were doing. And sure. Andrew chores, and the officer in charge's name was uh, Wiley Aldrich. He was first class bosun's mate. And he was one guy you wouldn't want to run into in the dark if you just saw him. He scared <laughs> the hell out of him. Pussy cat. Really? Nice <laughs> but he was in charge, and then we had a fireman and a uh, engine man, mm -hmm. and a seaman. Well, that was me, and I was a recruit. I mean, I'm sorry, a banner. I was an a, a, a apprentice at that time. Okay. And so anyway, that way our life settled down. So we we take turns cooking, and you never argued, never complained <laughs> about the cook. <laughs> <laughs> that was one thing you never did. You ate with whatever was put in front of you. They're always simple meals. Sure. But anyway, we would sit there in the one room and study and and play cards and that was the last time I ever played cards in my life. And, uh, <laughs> anyway, that was basically it. And uh, we got along real well, never had any trouble with any of the men there. We go ashore and that was another experience in itself. There was only one teenage girl there in the entire <laughs> town <laughs> of which was about a hundred, oh, a couple of hundred, I guess at that time it was before they got built up. That was marathon and it's prime. In fact, and that was what year? I beg your pardon. What year was this? 1950. The uh, last part of December of 1950. So I was there from 50 to 50, beginning of 52. And uh, there was just the one young gal there, but none of us ever dated her. And but she would call out to us on the phone because we had to have a phone landline. Mm -hmm. and, and Looks like we lost you. And uh, oh, you're back. Hmm? We I lost you there for a second. The, the, the screen froze for a second. So we lost you when you were saying that none of their none of the crew dated the fifteen year or the, the the teenager. Yeah, we didn't. We just didn't date her, and mm -hmm. uh, we just stayed to ourselves. But she would call us out on a light and speak to us, and we'd do it for company. Sure. And uh, once a month, we go to when we got our money. We got paid once a month. We got also compensatory lib compensatory uh, monies to our chow and so forth. Because oh, really? Duty. Yeah. So then we go down to Miami to the Key West. I, I said Miami. I meant Key West down there to the Naval Station. Mm -hmm. And they had a big commissary there. So we'd go ahead and, and buy our big blue groceries there. Well, it didn't always work out. We would do that part all right. But then we went get back to the boat. Uh, the wind would have picked up and the waves are chopping and we can't get the boat back out to the light. Sure. <laughs> so then we're forced to stay there. So we have to stay overnight. Well, fortunately for us, uh, the boat's family was there. His wife and two young sons were there and they had a little house. Oh, that's so nice. They always had a rig, bed rigged up for us. That's very so nice. We always managed to sleep overnight if we had a problem. 
So when you had your compensatory week off, is that Key West is where you always went? Repeat that again. When you had your compensatory week off, did you always go to Key West or did you ever go anywhere else? Oh, no, I went home. Oh, really? My Greyhound bus and, and I'd go there and then come back. And uh, so that was enjoyable. I had no problem with that. Uh, sometimes, uh, getting back to the story about the boat, mm-hmm. which is rough, we can uh, need the groceries where we go out there. And we go under the uh, catwalk, which extended out over the side of the light. If you ever seen pictures of light, you might see the the catwalk as it sticks out. Right. And uh, so, man up on the deck would be standing there with a bucket on a rope, and then we pass under the the catwalk. He would drop the bucket down, and we dump as much of the groceries into the bucket as we could. Then he'd haul it up. We'd keep right on going. Mm-hmm. Go around a big circle and then come back under again with the waves chopping and bouncing us up and down, but we didn't dare to go any closer because we could get smashed against the uh, bulkhead there, the, the uh, post. Mm-hmm. And uh, so then when we got that done, we'd go back to shore and that's where we'd spend the night. Oh, okay. And then the next day, if it was calm, then we went back out to the light. Hmm. And uh, one time we were there when they had a hurricane, I think it was 1951. And uh, that was kind of an experience. <laughs> and uh, the uh, wind really picked up. And of course, we prepare for the storm by closing all the hatches. When I say hatches, I mean stored uh, iron doors, which mm-hmm. were completely doors, no openings, no look, no glass to look through or anything. You have your regular French doors. But then these would swing shut from outside of that. And there was a bar that would go across the door to keep from coming open. Mm-hmm. So once we got in there, we were sealed in there for the duration of the storm. Wow. So it was listening and, and see you know, and, uh, on the radio what was going on. And then look at the anemometer spinning around. And then and then you know, just sweat it on out. Well, then the, the waves would be smashing up against the light and they would vibrate. The light, like it, doing like a tuning fork, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and that would last for hours. And, but you're completely, in, depending on the lights inside it, the, for illumination. So that was basically it. And then we had some unusual times. One time I was going to shore down to Key West for the groceries, and uh, the boat's uh, daughter went with us to buy stuff also. And uh, so she had her little baby boy with her. Mm-hmm. So the, we were all crammed into this little car. No problem going down, but then turn around, come back, the boy be on my lap. Well, then he decided he had to urinate. <laughs> and I had my whites on. So, <laughs> I, so my crotch was thoroughly soaked by the time I got back to the light. <laughs> And the one bad time we had was when we had a fellow from the um, USS, Hydro- USS Hydrographer from uh, St. Petersburg, which is a, a ship that was uh, used to uh, coordinate spots in the water mm-hmm. which, from one place to another. And uh, they would go ahead and measure the depth of the water in a given place. And then this one name, one individual by the name of Bernie, and he's a heck of a nice guy. And he was probably in his 50s, I guess. But this young guy that was with him was uh, one of the ones that came, was very unusual. He was small, underweight, black, wavy hair. And, and we don't know yet how he could do it, but he could take a, a, a complete deck of cards and have you hold them, and he could tell you what cards you're looking at. <laughs> we haven't figured out to this day. I haven't figured out. <laughs> we could take them out of a cigar box. Uh-huh. <laughs> we could shuffle them, do anything we wanted. He could tell us every card, never missed one. Really? He was also a mean bugger. He was not easy to get along with. Okay. And uh, so this one day, 
we had one kid on our, I won't give his last name, uh, but we call him Hoop. Hoop? He's kind of like a Mickey Rooney or Andy Hardy type of the movies. Bobbling and bouncing, blonde hair, hair and so forth, big old grin on his face all the time. And he was an engineer. And he came on after I did. Mm-hmm. And he just come out of high school and gone right in. I've been out of high school seven years when I went in the Coast Guard. Mm-hmm. But anyway, he came out there and this one day he was shaving, which was a laugh. But he only had maybe 20 hairs on his whole entire <laughs> face. This individual came up behind him with a knife in his hand and then held it right in front of his throat when the, when the kid was in front of the mirror trying oh, to shave. Gosh. And uh, I yelled at him and said, stop it right now. So he looked at me and then he finally put the knife down. And so then that night, we had to sleep in the same room, that one little quarter I was talking about. Sure. I was in an upper bunk and uh, there's four bunks in that room and he was the one that I owned across that little room. And I heard the springs squeak. And I opened my eyes and looked, and it was him. Mm-hmm. He was coming right toward me. And just he got to me, I kind of jumped out and hit him at the same time with my feet mm-hmm. and knocked him down. And then the other fellow real quick woke up and grabbed him too. So between the two, we got him tied. And then we had to kept him that way that night. And then the next day we called Miami. Oh, excuse me. Here I go again. <laughs> West. Uh-huh. And so they sent a boat up, troll boat, and so they went and got him, hauled him off. Wow. <laughs> so that was one experience. That is an experience. <laughs> My gosh. Another experience was I was standing out on the deck looking out at the sea because freighters and, and uh, cargo ships are all going past us all the time. Mm-hmm. So we see these ships and this one day i saw something bobbing in the water i couldn't figure out what it was <clears throat> so I had the field glasses out and went and look and here it was world war of war ii mine bobbing on the surface <laughs> of the water. and it was heading in our direction and oh see, great these were pushing it in so i called one of my buddies we real quick got the double ender and dropped it down in the water and so we went out to intercept it and so we got Fortunately, the waves weren't that high. They were just kind of like swells. And so I was able to tie a line around the, the points sticking out. Mm-hmm. And so we got tied, and then we towed it behind the boat. So we got back to the light and made sure we kept it off, off the boat, I mean, off the light, away from the light. And then we mm-hmm. called Key West. So they real quick brought a craft up there to retrieve it the next day but that was the next that day loaded or not we don't because world war ii had only been over five years mm-hmm. <laughs> and they mined Jeez. it and you know, down in key west they had all those ships they had the submarine tenders the submarine submarines came from port to be ref- outfitted and everything so that was quite active so when you went out to retrieve the mine you just lashed a, a rope around it and just yeah. basically hauled it back Jeez. How close to the boat when was you're it? When you do these things, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> How close to the boat was it? I beg your pardon? How close to the boat was it? Well, I had to lean out to be able to touch it and everything. To <laughs> the line and everything, you know, but it was just swells. And they said it wasn't rough. If it had been rough, I wouldn't be able to do it. <sighs> and uh, so another experience there was one day I heard somebody yelling out from the water, you know. I couldn't understand. I just heard his voice yelling. So I went out on the deck and looked and down the boat. There was a boat, little kind of a rowboat type thing with an outboard on it. And I saw these kids on board, three of them, on this little boat. They're yelling up. So I was trying to find out what they were trying to tell me. Well, it turned out one of them had been shot through the foot with a spear. Ooh. Out spear fishing off the reef. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and Sombrero Reef got its name because it's kind of shaped like a sombrero. That's where mm-hmm. the name Sombrero came from. <clears throat> and then just beyond that, it was just deep water. 
with reefs sticking up, individual reefs, which was the most beautiful thing to see when you were swimming in there with all the types of types of coral and and fish and so and so forth. But anyway, that's another story. And uh, anyway, real quick, went down, dropped the gangway down, which was ordinarily held up. So we went down. We get down to the level of the boat, and the fellow's name was Ray Steiner, and this kid was six foot four, tall kid, and then another was uh, Wingy. I can't remember his first name, but he was name was Wingy, and the third guy Debu, Debu, and uh, turn out this Debu was a wise guy mm -hmm. trying to cock the spear gun. And it misfired, and then Steiner was just sitting there, and it went right through his foot, just above his foot. And uh, it right in his leg, you know. So we got Ray aboard uh, the light, helped him up there, got him out on deck. Well, I didn't what else, what else to do, like a figure out just about six inches was sticking out one side and a foot and a half out of the other side, <laughs> which was twisting his leg because mm -hmm. of the weight of it. So I just took a hacksaw and sawed off even. <laughs> you can imagine the vibrations. Oh, I can't imagine the pain. <laughs> Again, we had to call Miami. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the funny part of this is, after I left the light and, and we, we ended up going to this Androscoggin in Miami, uh, and I was hosting late by that time, and I got all in there, two of my crew members were Steiner, Ray Steiner and, and Indy. Come on. Yeah, they had enlisted after after uh, me, or they had just gotten out of high school, and then they, like the way I did it and everything, they decided to try the Coast Guard. So here they were. I'm now, now I'm their boss. <laughs> That's pretty cool. And they said, well, you know, kind of things. Then swimming in the water, when you go down deep, you're looking at the coral sticking up from the right and the left with sa sandy bottom in between. And then one day I'm down there looking, and here goes a shark right past me. And I'm just holding my breath, watching it. <laughs> my goggles on. We didn't have face masks or anything. Uh -huh. And uh, we just had to go up to the surface and grab air. And the shark just swam, swam right past, right past <laughs> me. I just looked at him go by. No problem. Another time it was a Jewfish, and it weighed about 60 pounds, I guess. And he went by, and, and the manta rays it was beautiful. Plus sure. All the, Millions of little fish darting in and out among the reefs. Mm -hmm. And uh, one day I was down there swimming with my buddy there. And we never wore anything gaudy. We took our ID bracelets off because they flashed light mm -hmm. reflection in the water. So we were down in the water and uh, I was looking around. And here's about probably about 15, 10 to 15 barracuda. In a circle around me. Oh boy. And they're just opening their mouths and closing them very slowly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just watched them. And I went too far from the ladder, which was hanging down from the uh, catwalk that I was telling you about earlier, where you just walked out. And so I was watching them, and they were all just watching me. They're as curious as me as I was of them. Sure. And so all of a sudden, I saw one of them was moving his mouth, but was agitated. They oh, boy. Moving back and forth from side to side, and the mouth was opening and shutting in rapid succession. About that time, it came right at me. And I just moved my head a little bit to the right and went right over my left shoulder. <sighs> well, but that's about all it took to get me to grab a hold of that rope ladder. <laughs> and I was fly that up there. <laughs> but the reason I was even in the water it was because earlier in the year, I guess it was, maybe a year before, we had a group from uh, Florida State University come visit us. And these were marine biologists. Okay. And uh, they were studying things, uh, fish and coral and so forth in the area. And I was up on the top of the light where I could get a good look and see what they were doing, looking, looking down on them. There's barracuda out in the water with them and all that. And they were just swimming around. And so when they finally came aboard the light, I said, aren't you afraid of the barracuda? Because I had never been in with them. No, they don't bother you. <laughs> well, that was what I found. Because if you move toward them, they move back. If you move back, <laughs> they move forward. They just, but that one was the exception. <laughs> yeah, you found the one angry one. 
<laughs> those are some of the things that happen when you don't expect on yeah. a lighthouse. <laughs> so that was almost two years on there. And then when the time came to, I also studied for my ocean's mate reading, mm -hmm. uh, my correspondence and so forth. And that's one of the more serious sides there, preparing for your next reading. So I became third class boatswain's mate. And uh, that was when they decided it was time for me to leave the lighthouse. And so that was basically the story. I was giving my notice that I was report for duty down at Miami Beach at the uh, WPG 68 Andrews mm -hmm. Cutter, which is a high class cutter class. Mm -hmm. Coast Guard, she'd been built in 46. I was a young ship. And this is a, a boat. A lot of people must call anything a boat. <laughs> it gets sickly from talking. <laughs> but anyway, the difference between a boat is, and a ship is a boat is something you get into when a ship is sinking. <laughs> Unless it's a submarine, <laughs> that's a boat, a U boat. But otherwise, boats are what you get into. When all else fails. Anyway, that was it. So that was the end of my experiences on the life and uh, the entrance to another life with a cutter system. 